Uh, her practice involves patent prosecution, patent search and analysis, um, patent invalidation proceeding, and patent infringement litigation. Her presentation will last about 40 minutes with up to 10 additional minutes for questions. Uh, should time not allow for every question, you are all welcome to send us your questions by email and we shall duly reply. Also, you may raise your questions through text message during the presentation. Now I will leave time to Mrs. Ho. Uh, let's welcome. Thank you, Zhang Xing. Good evening, or to some of you, good morning or good afternoon. I'm Ying Ying Ho, or you can also call me Ying Ying. Though I may have felt sleepy this time on usual days, today I'm not. Instead, even excited and happy. Thanks for all of you to participate this special online communication. As IP professional, we all know that invalidation procedure is so important for a patent, which may decide its life and death. Therefore, though without smoke of gunpowder, invalidation is another kind of war. Today, I would like to share some tips for Chinese invalidation practice, which I hope may be helpful to you and help you to hold a more favorable position as a patentee or an invalidation petitioner. In the following presentation, in order to allow you to have a clear picture for the Chinese invalidation procedure, I will at first give you a brief introduction of the Chinese invalidation flow, and then share some tips in three aspects. That is preparation for reasoning, observations, and evidences. Amendments during invalidation and interaction with the panel. Now let's begin with the Chinese invalidation flow. As you can see, the invalidation is initiated by a petitioner. When filing the request for invalidation, reasons and corresponding evidences need to be submitted in the meantime. And within one month from the request filing date, new reasons and evidences for invalidation could be supplemented. The re-examination and invalidation department from China National Intellectual Property Administration, or CNIPA, will establish a panel consisting of three members upon receiving the petitioner's invalidation request. The panel will be in charge of the invalidation procedure, forwarding the invalidation request to the patentee upon receiving it, together with all the reasons and evidences including the supplemented ones. The patentee has the chance to respond to the petitioner's reasons and, and evidences within one month from receipt of these reasons and evidences. However, the patentee could also keep silent at this stage and wait until the oral proceedings to make observations. Again, the panel will forward patentee's observations, if there is, to the petitioner. Regarding the panel's forwarding, if the petitioner and the patentee both file their observations by CPC, which is a dedicated electronic system utilized by the CNIPA, the panel will forward documents to the parties by CPC as well. However, if any one of the two parties files the documents by airmail, then the panel will forward the documents by airmail too. Different time costs for these two forwarding manners will sometimes decide whether the petitioner or the patentee is active or passive, which will, will be discussed later. After several rounds of petitioner's reasoning and the patentee's response, oral proceedings will be held to allow the panel to listen to the two parties' observations face-to-face -face 
and the petitioner and the patentee will also debate directly at the oral proceedings. After the oral proceedings, the panel will continue to examine the patentability by taking the two parties' observations into account and then make the final decision. If the petitioner or the patentee is not satisfied with the decision, they can institute legal action at the Beijing Intellectual Property Court. That's the general flow of Chinese invalidation procedure. Now let's see what tips could be utilized during such flow. First, how can we make preparation for reasoning, observations, and evidences? As an invalidation petitioner, surely you wish to use reasons for invalidating the concerned patent as many as possible. According to the Chinese practice, the reasons for invalidation include the claims cannot be supported by the description. The technical solution of the independent claim cannot solve its technical problem. The amendments have gone beyond the original disclosure. The description has not been set forth sufficiently clear that the person skilled in the art cannot carry out the invention. The claims are not clear and the claims lack novelty or inventiveness. However, our suggestion is to focus on the novelty and the inventiveness reasons, because our past experiences show that the panel prefers the novelty and the inventiveness reasons than the other ones when judging the patentability of the concerned patent. In their opinion, the issues of the other reasons have already been examined a lot during the prosecution for allowing the patent. Why for the novelty and the inventiveness, since the examiner for the prosecution may have missed some prior art references. Re-examination on the novelty and the inventiveness during invalidation is worthy. The panel will even have a subconscious mind that if the petitioner only submits some non-novelty and inventiveness reasons, it proves that he can actually not invalidate the concerned patent, but just to find some reasons casually for invalidation so as to pause litigation of patent infringement. Therefore, use reasons for novelty or inventiveness for invalidation as much as possible. However, for the other reasons, if the corresponding defects are very obvious, for example, if sufficient evidences could be provided to prove that the asserted technical effect in the description goes against the scientific theory, the panel will also pay attention to. And when preparing the reasons of inventiveness, use references in the same art as much as possible. The panel believes that if the combination of references that can achieve the claimed patent belong to the same art, such combination is more obvious and can prove more that the claimed patent lacks inventiveness. Instead, if the combined references belong to different arts, the combination itself may have difficulty. Furthermore, sometimes the petitioner may find many references, which when combined with each other may affect the inventiveness of the claim patent. Still, such combinations of references are not the more the better. The panel does not like long and redundant arguments. According to the guidelines, when the petitioner submits more than two combinations of references for rejecting the inventiveness, the main one combination needs to be selected and will be discussed and analyzed first. If not making such selection, the first combination of references will be considered as the main one. 
actually, though emphasizing the importance of the main combination of references, the guidelines do not eliminate the other combinations of references. However, in the practice, in order to save time during the oral proceedings, the panel usually wishes the petitioner to only make arguments based on the selected main combination of references, while abandoning using the other combinations. In the panel's view, the main combination should be the petitioner's most confident one in rejecting the inventiveness. If such combination can still not prove the concerned patent lacks inventiveness, there's no need to take further consideration for the other ones. However, we suggest not agreeing to abandon the other combinations. In response to the panel's request, the petitioner could choose two combinations of references that may affect the concerned patent's inventiveness and submit that both of the two can obviously lead to the concerned patent. Furthermore, never acknowledge to abandon the other combinations during the oral proceedings. Moreover, although the panel seemed to like the novelty and the inventiveness reasons more, sometimes the other reasons could also assist a lot in arguing for inventiveness. I will give an example for this point. As you can see, the concerned patent claim a breathing loop device for an anesthesia machine. Actually, the improvement of the breathing loop device is just the locking means. And in the independent claim, the breathing loop device only comprises said locking means. In the reasons and evidences submitted by the petitioner, in addition to the inventiveness reasons, it is also asserted that the technical solution of the independent claim can actually not solve its technical problem. Because a breathing loop device for an anesthesia machine necessarily comprises other components in addition to the claim locking means. As discussed above, the panel does not think such issue is worthy to be re-evaluated during invalidation. However, the petitioner still insists on submitting such reasons during oral proceedings. In response, the patentee argues that the technical problem to be solved is a firm connection, which can just be solved by the claimed locking means. So, there's no need to further define other components in the claim, which have nothing to do with the improvement and should be known clearly by the person skilled in the art. In the next argue point about inventiveness, one preferable combination of references is D7 and D2. Though D2 has disclosed a very similar structure of the claimed locking means, it relates to a cooking pot, different from D7 and the concerned patent. The patentee argues that these two references belong to different arts, so D2's disclosed structure cannot be applied to D7's breathing loop device or even applied to D7, the claimed invention can still not be achieved, which may need many other components. The petitioner then reminds that the patentee has acknowledged just now that the improvement of the claimed invention is only the locking means. D2 has taught such locking means, which can also solve the technical problem of firm connection. As to the patentees asserted many other components needed in the claimed breathing loop device for an anesthesia machine, they are not defined 
in the claim and can be obtained by the person skilled in the art as acknowledged by the patent team. Such arguments from the petitioner apparently put the patent team in a passive condition and in the meantime, touch the panel a lot. Though they may prefer combinations of references in the same art, they cannot deny the combination of D7 with D2 can obviously lead to the concerned patent. Finally, the patentee has to narrow the relatively wide protection range of independent claim one by further incorporating more dependent claims. In this example, before the oral proceedings, the petitioner has submitted altogether 10 references, selecting D1, D2, and D7 as the closest prior art, respectively, with D2, D3, D4, D5, and D7 combined into D1, with common knowledge combined into D2, and with D10 or D2 combined into D7. The arguments have covered 40 pages in total. The panel wishes the petitioner to select the most confident combination during the oral proceedings. But the petitioner eventually selects two, D2 plus common knowledge and uh, D7 plus D10 or D2 and submits that these two combinations are both very sufficient to reflect the obvious, obviousness of the claimed invention. If must select one, the combination of D7 with D2 is chosen, but the other combinations are not abandoned. As to the combination of D1 with many refer references, the panel apparently does not have enough patience to study them all. So the petitioner does not describe them in details during oral proceedings, but always insists them as evidences. Sometimes, if there are many references that have disclosed the same technical feature of the claim patent, we suggest arguing said technical feature as a common knowledge directly and those many references could be the evidences for proving it's common in the art. Our another tip for the petitioner is about the preparation of the cited references. According to the guidelines, any evidence in foreign language needs to be translated into Chinese. In the practice, for a cited reference in a non-Chinese language, the panel will only see the parts that have been translated into Chinese while ignoring the non-translated parts directly. Our suggestion is to submit Chinese translation for the whole text of a cited reference, which could also facilitate the panel to find concerned paragraphs. In order to save cost for the non-cited paragraphs, machine translation could be provided. For the cited parts in the reference, which are very important, careful review is needed to ensure the correct translation. Or otherwise, if the patentee challenges the translation and the retranslated cited parts disclose different information, it will be very disadvantageous to the petitioner. For the non-cited paragraphs, although their translations could be performed by machine, the petitioner still needs to review them carefully before oral proceedings. If the cited reference has thought that it cannot be applied to the application situation like the claim invention, 
Even a certain distinguished technical feature may have been disclosed in such cited reference. It may still teach away the claim invention. Reviewing non-cited parts could find such teach away reference earlier, which may not be used as evidence anymore. Moreover, if time is possible, be familiar with the technical solutions of the cited reference as much as possible before oral proceedings. There's an example that during the oral proceedings, the patenting redetermines the technical problem of the claimed invention to be minimizing structure, which has never been mentioned before, and argues that the references asserted by the petitioner have not taught solving such technical problem. However, the petitioner makes a response quickly, pointing out that one cited reference actually also teaches solving said technical problem and indicates the corresponding paragraph immediately. The patentee does not expect that the petitioner can find the corresponding paragraph so quickly because the technical problem is newly determined and all the cited parts of the references do not mention it. However, the petitioner has read through all the cited references carefully and has studied a lot for the technical solutions recited therein, rather than only focusing on the cited parts. Our next tip for the petitioner is about time. There is an old saying in China, nothing is too deceitful in war, or in Chinese, bing bu yan zha, which means puzzling the opponent by faint as much as possible, so as to win the war. Now for the invalidation war, the invalidation petitioner could also hide the most aggressive weapon at first to puzzle the opponent. Sometimes even waiting until the very last day of the one month limit. Will the novelty inventiveness reasons and evidences be supplemented? Which will give the opponent a sudden attack since the time schedule for oral proceedings does not depend on whether any supplementary evidences or observations will be submitted. Sometimes after the patentee has just received the petitioner's supplemented reasons and evidences forwarded by the panel, the oral proceedings will begin. This is quite disadvantageous to the patentee. This strategy of time difference is particularly useful for forwarding documents by airmail. We have discussed a lot for tips suggested to the petitioner. Then how about the patentee? Now we will discuss the suggested tips for the patentee. As I will discuss later, as a matter of fact, the panel welcomes the two parties to contact them, for they wish to advance the invalidation procedure as fast as possible. Therefore, on the very last day of the one month limit for petitioner's supplement, if still no supplementary reasoning or evidences are received from the panel, the patentee could voluntarily contact the panel by telephone. For example, asking whether any supplementary has been received from the petitioner. If such supplemented reasons and evidences have been forwarded by the panel by airmail, the patentee could request the panel to email those supplemented documents as well, which could save the time of post route. Another tip for the patentee is to give back an abrupt observations. Although according to the guidelines, there's only one month for the patentee to make a response or arguments 
upon receiving the petitioner's submitted reasons and evidences awarded by the panel. In the practice, in order to satisfy the principle of public hearing, even the patentee buys the response out of the one month limit. Such response will still be accepted. The petitioner may receive such observations or amendments just before the oral proceedings. The panel will usually first telephone the petitioner and then email the documents to him directly due to urgency. This will apparently disorganize the petitioner's original prepared arguments during oral proceedings. When facing such condition, the petitioner can also submit in the oral proceedings that he or she needs more time for considering the patentee's observations that has actually exceeded the one month limit. And the panel will usually give the petitioner another chance to file observations after the oral proceedings. Another tip for the patentee is to take good advantage of simulation animation. The simulation animation is particularly useful for complicated mechanical structure, which may reflect the working principle more clearly. There's a very successful example in which for a quite complicated dynamic working principle, the inventor illustrates a dynamic simulation video on the spot of the oral proceedings, showing the configurations and the conditions of the claimed product very clearly, which has been highly appreciated by the panel. After seeing the dynamic simulation video, the panel firmly believes that such structure should apparently have inventiveness over the cited reference evidences. However, in perspective of the petitioner, do not be affected a lot by such condition. Even such provided a dynamic simulation video is very fantastic. It usually corresponds to a specific example of application. Therefore, it could be emphasized that such simulation animation just reflects the technical solution of a dependent claim rather than the independent one. So the independent claim still needs to be narrowed so as to reflect the same product as the simulation animation. The above are all about tips for preparation of reasoning observations and evidences. Now let's see the tips for amendments during invalidation. According to the present guidelines, manners for amendments during invalidation seem to bring more possibilities compared to the past. In addition to the manners of deleting claims or deleting technical solutions, in the past, if a claim needs to be further defined, it can only incorporate other claims. But now such further definition could be made by adding only a part of technical features in other claims. That is to say, there's no need to incorporate all the technical features of one or more other claims. However, it does not mean that any addition of technical features will be accepted by the panel. We should not ignore this point of the situation. The technical solution of the newly amended claim should also fall within the original disclosure. Some people may have wondered, since the technical feature A and B both fall within the original disclosure, why their combination does not? From the panel's perspective, when a claim is amended, what should be paid attention to is whether or not 
the technical solution of the whole claim falls within the original disclosure. That is to say, they will check whether or not the combination of the amended technical features can be supported by the original disclosure. Therefore, when intending to amend a claim by adding technical features from other claims, the patentee is suggested to prepare the corresponding support for the technical solution of such amended claim or the support for the combination of the amended technical features. So as to respond to the panel or the opponent's potential challenge. According to our past experience, for amendments during invalidation, the panel is very cautious. They will not allow the number of the claims to be increased. For example, if the patentee intends to amend the independent claim by further incorporating two dependent claims respectively, that is one independent claim will become two and the whole number of claims will be doubled. The panel will perhaps reject such amendments based on the reasons that combinations of technical features in some new claims may not fall within the original disclosure. In such a war without smoke of gun power between patentee and invalidation petitioner, since the final decision is made by the panel, the focus is more like winning over the panel than arguing for a patent or a claim. In the Chinese practice, during invalidation, cases are gradually examined by a panel from the re-examination and the invalidation department of CNIPA. The panel consists of three members, including a chairman, a first examiner, or we also call him a chief examiner, and a second examiner. Said re-examination and invalidation department is like the past patent re-examination board. But the past patent re-examination board is independent from CNIPA, while the present re-examination and invalidation department belongs to CNIPA which means legal action cannot be instituted against the re-examination and invalidation department, but against the CNIPA. Among the three members in the panel, actually the chief examiner is in more charge of the whole procedures. He or she will take more time to understand the technical solution of the allowed patent and study all the documents filed by the patentee and the invalidation petitioner, and share all these with the other two members, together with his or her intended opinions, allowing the other two members to consider by themselves based thereon. Furthermore, the chief examiner is also the representative of the panel for communicating with the patentee and the invalidation petitioner. We could voluntarily contact the chief examiner. For example, the patentee could ask the chief examiner whether the petitioner has any new supplementary reasons or evidences, and the petitioner could ask whether the patentee has any further observations and the like. Sometimes, if the time schedule for oral proceedings is really difficult to you, you may also reflect such difficulty to the chief examiner to see whether it is possible to change another time or another manner. For example, due to COVID-19, perhaps you cannot fly to Beijing as scheduled. The panel may agree to change the offline oral proceedings to online. As mentioned above, for the sake of principle of procedural economy, in order to advance the case forward appropriately, 
the panel welcomes the two parties to voluntarily contact them. Sometimes the chief examiner will even voluntarily contact the patentee or petitioner for discussing about their wonders and the puzzles for the observations. In this case, the patentee or the petitioner is suggested to support or cooperate with the panel, making explanations for their wonders and the puzzles such that they could sufficiently understand the asserted reasons or the claimed technical solution. For example, by providing an animation video as mentioned previously. In addition, if many references are provided, the panel may do not have much time to read through for all the combinations of reference evidences. The petitioner could then extract the most important one or more combinations by email for the panel's review. Surely, it does not mean abandoning the other combinations. When receiving the chief examiner's call after the oral proceedings, the panel may have their intended opinions, but no final decision. They may wish to listen to the two parties' final observations, particularly from the party to which the intended opinions may be disadvantageous. In this case, please try your very best for arguing, which may be your last chance. It is better to provide with some new points from different perspectives, or even make a concession as needed. For example, if all the claims of the concerned patent are to be invalidated from the chief examiner's toe, the patentee may voluntarily choose the most inventive dependent claim to be incorporated into the independent claim and re-emphasize its unobviousness to the chief examiner. Since the oral proceedings usually pay more attention to the independent claims. The arguments for the inventiveness of the independent claim at this time may be accepted by the chief examiner. Although in theory, after the oral proceedings, the patentee's amendment is only limited to deleting claims or deleting technical solutions for the sake of principle of procedural economy, amendments for narrowing are still allowed in the practice. As long as such amendments are good to advance the invalidation procedure appropriately. In summary, before the final decision is issued, everything is possible. However, when voluntarily making explanations to the panel, if they seem to be not willing to listen to or have clearly understood the working principle and the like, do not emphasize the facts they may have been clear enough again and again, or otherwise will even make the panel feel annoyed. That's all for my presentation today. Thanks for all your patiently listening. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing, Mrs. Ho. Uh, that is quite informative and helpful. Now we will go to the Q&A session. Uh, here is a question from Jessica Falcon, uh, which is, uh, thank you, Mrs. Ho, for your informative presentation. Uh, can your suggested tips above be applied to a utility model? If not, uh, are there any tips for utility model? Okay, Mrs. Ho, uh, would you please share with us your opinions about this question? Sure. Um, thank you, Jessica. Uh, most of the above tips can be applied to utility model as well. <clears throat> Particularly, though not examined during prosecution. Inventiveness is also the reason that can be used 
for invalidating a utility model. However, for the number of the cited references, generally only one or two are used for judging the inventiveness of a utility model. Surely there's an exception. If the utility model is considered as a simple superimposition of prior arts, more than two references could be used. Uh, I hope such answer could be helpful to you, Jessica. Okay, uh, one more question from Simon Jacobs. Uh, Mrs. Ho, uh, thank you for your introduction. If the patentee wishes to narrow this independent claim after the, the oral proceedings and the panel also agrees such amendment, can the petitioner refuse it? Uh, Mrs. Ho, what's your opinions about this question? Okay, thank you, Simon. Yes, if such amendment is not favorable to the petitioner, the petitioner could refuse it when receiving the telephone call from the chief examiner. Since such amendment is generally not allowed after the oral proceedings, unless it could advance the procedure. The panel also needs the petitioner's agreement for such amendment, or otherwise the procedure cannot be advanced. Therefore, yes, the petitioner can refuse your mentioned amendment, Simon. Okay. Uh... The third question uh, is from Don Kemp. Uh, dear Ho Ying Ying, thanks for this helpful and the clear explanations and tips. One question, please. Are there any statistics available on the annual number of oral hearings? as well as annual number of oral hearings leading to allowance and the rejection respectively. Thanks again. Uh, Ms. Ho, uh, what, uh, can you, can you uh, please answer this question? Okay, thank you, Don. Your question uh, is very interesting and very valuable. Uh, However, as to the statistics, um, we, may, we may need uh, some time to uh, check for such statistics and uh, give you the uh, details uh, later. Okay, maybe... Uh... Uh, we will have to. We will have. We have. We will have to spend some time to check on the internet about this st statistics uh, on the annual number of oral hearings. Uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, the the CNIPA does not pub does not uh, go public uh, this kind of stati statistics uh so and uh, but we uh some some law firm like us or some uh, business uh company they will do some uh search uh data search from uh, the internet from the public uh data and uh, do some uh statistics uh, uh okay let's see uh I, I think we can get some uh, numbers uh, for you, Mr. Don Camp, and uh, we will we will get to you uh, later uh, from uh, from email. Um, okay, uh, thank you all. I think uh, it's already enough for the Q and A session, and it's almost the time to conclude today's webinar. Uh, the different jurisdictions may have different practice in invalidation procedure. Uh, we hope that today's introduction could be of your help when facing issues with invalidation procedure in Chinese patent practice. As always, we SPTL will provide 
webinar centered on various topics in IP uh, in order for it to bring you the most added value. Please follow our post or notification. Uh, that is all for today's webinar. Uh, thank you and hope to see you next time. Uh, thank you for your time again. Bye-bye. Uh,